Good, happy Thursday evening, everyone. I'm Riley King, and welcome to this special report right here on the Riley King Network. Let's begin this special report this evening. Tonight's special report, Democrats make case for impeachment before senators. Let's give you a timeline of what time today's impeachment trial started and um, to where they are right now. And then we're going to show you a news report from WHDH 7 News. And then we're going to show you some live coverage of the impeachment trial. So let's begin with the rundown and timeline of today's events so far. At 1 o'clock p.m., impeachment prosecutors are continuing their remarks on the Senate floor. Chief Justice John Roberts noted that House impeachment managers had 16 hours and 42 minutes left of their total 24 hours to make their case regarding the impeachment charges against the president. At 1.17 p.m., Rep. Jerry Nadler, one of the House impeachment managers, is making the case against the president in the Senate trial. Nadler revealed that the president, Donald Trump, withheld the release of $391 million in military assistance that Ukraine needed to fight Russia aggression. Nadler also said that Trump withheld from Ukraine a long thought after meeting with the White House. The New York congressman said Trump's conduct was wrong, legally and dangerous. Trump has maintained that a phone call with the leader of Ukraine was perfect. At 1.22 p.m., President Donald Trump is commenting on the Senate trial as House managers continue their remarks. Trump said on Twitter the Democrats don't want to witness trade, which he said would make a big problem for them. Prosecutors are relying on the same loop of videotaped testimony after Trump's allies in the Republican controlled Senate blocked new witnesses. Republicans rejected Democrat efforts to get Trump aides, including former National Security Advisor John Bolton, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney to testify in back-to-back -back votes earlier this week. At 2.58 p.m., the Senate is taking a 15-minute break. At 3.17 p.m., Jay Solo, an attorney for the President, Donald Trump, answered reporters' questions about what the President's defense strategy would include in the impeachment trial. Each side has 24 hours over the three days to make their case as part of opening arguments. At 3.43 p.m., Rep. Adam Schiff, Democrat of California, said that President Donald Trump wanted an announcement or investigation that was tied to Moscow. Schiff said that intent came from completely bogus push conspiracy theory in which Ukraine, not Russia, hacked a Democrat server. The theory, which is not supported by U.S. intelligence agencies, accused Ukraine for interfering in the 2016 U.S. election to keep Trump from winning. At 4.40 p.m., Rep. Adam Schiff, the lead House manager questioned Donald Trump's timing for calls of corruption in Ukraine. 
the House Tradition noted in its impeachment report that aid Trump approved for Ukraine was $510 million in 2017 and $359 million in 2018 before the withhold of aid in 2019. Schiff said that before news broke of former Vice President Joe Biden's candidacy for President, Trump showed no interest in Ukraine. At 6.25 p.m., the Senate is taking a 30-minute break. And now let's take a look at this news report from 7 News, WHDH in Boston. News reporter from 7 News, WHDH from Boston, Dan Housley, is at the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Democrats focus day two of trial on Trump's dangerous abuse. Let's take a listen to that report from Dan Housley. Fiver and caffeine gum. Ow! A caffeine boost with empowerment pow. The impeachment trial still center stage in Washington. On this day two of opening arguments, the House impeachment managers are laser focused on potential abuse of power. Busy day on the Senate floor. Let's go to 7 Stan Housley, live in Washington with the key uh, moments of this day. Dan. Well, Tim, today we heard from both Massachusetts senators as the House impeachment managers continue to make their case there on the Senate floor. The second of three days, 24 hours of arguments. It's all the Democrats' case inside the Senate chamber, though outside in the Capitol hallways, both sides trying to make their case. The president's conduct is wrong. It is illegal. It is dangerous. House Democrats continued their argument to remove President Trump from office by focusing on the charge of abuse of power. President Trump abused his power when he used his office to solicit and pressure Ukraine to meddle in our elections for his personal gain. While Democrats call the House managers' arguments persuasive, Republicans warn Americans have only heard part of the story. There is an old proverb uh, that says the first one always seems right until they're cross-examined. Uh, and so I'm waiting to be able to hear that White House response in the coming days, and they'll have their opportunity to tell their side of the story. Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey tells me the arguments so far are really aimed at reaching just a handful of moderate Republicans whose votes Democrats need to allow new witnesses and evidence. Do you say anything that tells you that any of these moderates uh, are cracking? My hope is that perhaps one or two or three or ultimately four of them will change their minds, and they will give us the witnesses and the documents, but... Uh, ultimately, I'm not very optimistic. On witnesses, President Trump tweeted this morning they had their chance, but pretended to rush most unfair and corrupt hearing in congressional history. Some Republicans are arguing those Democratic senators running for president shouldn't be sitting in judgment of a man they hope to replace. They're actually going to be voting to remove from the ballot the name of Donald Trump, not just remove him from office, but remove him from the ballot in 2020. So I believe they have a conflict of interest in their decision. One of those candidates, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, fired back. Based on what I've seen in this impeachment uh, trial so far, it's pretty clear that there are some Republicans who are challenged on the concept of conflict of interest. President Trump staying on the move during his impeachment trial. He just got back from the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, and tonight he headed off to South Florida, where he will attend the Republican winter meetings at his Doral Golf Resort. We're live in Washington. Dan Housley, 7 News. Dan, thank you. And just going back quickly, uh, it continues there on the Senate floor with Representative Hakeem Jeffries, a Democrat from New York, now making his case, uh, presenting evidence to the Senate. We'll be watching the arguments all evening and bring you updates as we get them. Seven Stan Housley is there. He will continue his loud reports from Washington throughout the trial, and that does include this evening right here on the news station. Okay, and there you go. On that report from... Of news, Dan Housley. He's live in Washington, D.C. And now we're gonna turn to our TV and watch some live ABC News special report of the impeachment trial now. So, um, 
one of the house managers are speaking right now. So let's listen in and see what's happening and taking place. Seven, by the irregular policy channel, I have come to understand was guided by Mr. Giuliani. It was clear this were conditions driven by irregular policies. And we know this too because Ambassador Sondland said so at the July 10 meeting. Dr. Fiona Hill described the scene in Ambassador Bolton's office where the quid pro quo was made clear. Let's watch. The Ukrainian's uh, Mr. Daniluk uh, starts to ask about a White House meeting, and Ambassador Bolton was trying to parry this back. Although he's the national security advisor, he's not in charge of scheduling the meeting. We have input recommending the meetings, and this goes through a whole process. So it's not Ambassador Bolton's role to start pulling out the schedule and start saying, right, well, we're going to look and see if this Tuesday, this month is going to work with this. And he does not, as a matter of course, like to discuss the details of these meetings he likes to leave them to, you know, the appropriate staff for this. So this is already going to be an uncomfortable issue. As Ambassador Bolton uh, was trying to move that part of the discussion away, I think he was going to try to deflect it onto another wrap-up topic, Ambassador Sondland leaned in uh, basically to say, well, we have an agreement uh, that there will be a meeting um, if specific um, investigations uh, are, are put underway. And that's when I saw Ambassador Bolton stiffen. I was sitting behind him in the chair, and I saw him sit back uh, slightly like this. He'd been more moving forward like I am to the table. And for me, that was an unmistakable body language, and it caught my attention. And then he looked up to the clock, and you know, at his watch, or towards his wrist in any case, uh, again, I was sitting behind him, and basically he said, well, um, you know, it's been really great to see you. I'm afraid I've got another, um, another meeting. Ambassador Bolton stiffened. Quite a description. Lieutenant Colonel Ventman's testimony is consistent with Dr. Hill's recollection of the July 10 meeting. And it was made clear that the deal for the White House meeting was investigations. Let's watch Lieutenant Colonel Ventman. I want to move now to that July 10th meeting that you referenced, Colonel Vindman. What exactly did Ambassador Sondland say when the Ukrainian officials raised the idea of a White House meeting? As I recall, he referred to specific investigations um, that Ukrainians would have to deliver in order to get the, these meetings. Lieutenant Vindman, first-hand knowledge, they would have to deliver in order to get these meetings. It was also clear that this wasn't about general investigations about corruption. This was about corruption, it wasn't, wasn't about corruption at all. Ambassador Sondland directed everyone, including the Iranian, Ukrainian officials, to reconvene in the ward room, where he discussed the arrangement he had reached with Mr. Mulvaney in more detail. And he made clear that it was about specific investigations that would benefit President Trump personally. Here's Lieutenant Colonel Vindman testifying where he explains that Ambassador Sondland referred to the Bidens, Burisma, and the 2016 election, which had nothing to do with national security policy. Let's watch. Were the investigations, the specific investigations that Ambassador Sondland referenced in the larger meeting also discussed in the wardroom meeting? They were. What did Ambassador Sondland say? Ambassador Sondland referred to investigations into the, the Biden's Burisma in 2016. How did you respond, if at all? Um, I, I said that uh, this, this request to, inv uh, to conduct these meetings was inappropriate. These investigations was inappropriate and had nothing to do with national security policy. Nothing to do with national security policy. That's about sums it up, doesn't it? It has nothing to do with national security policy. 
President Trump's scheme was for his personal interest, not national security. And his testimony, once again, is corroborated. Dr. Hill joined the ward room conversation later and also recalled a discussion of investigations in a White House meeting and that Lieutenant Colonel Vindman said, quote, this is inappropriate. We're the National Security Council. We cannot be involved in this. Here's her testimony. And so when I came in, uh, Gordon Sunderland uh, was basically saying, well, look, we have a deal here that there will be a meeting. I have a deal here with, uh, with uh, Chief of Staff Mulvaney. There will be a meeting if the Ukrainians open up or announce these investigations and, uh, into 2016 in Burisma. And I cut it off immediately there. Because by this point, having heard Mr. Giuliani over and over again on the television and all of the issues uh, that he was um, asserting, by this point, it was clear that Burisma was code for the Bidens because Giuliani was laying it out there. Uh, I could see why Colonel Vindman was alarmed. And he said, this is inappropriate with the National Security Council. We can't be involved in this. And what's more, as Ambassador Sondland told us, everyone was in the loop meaning it became clear that President Trump was directing this. And Dr. Hill, who at one point confronted Gordon Sondland over this arrangement, further reached the conclusion that he was acting on the president's orders and coordinating with other senior officials. He had made this clear. He was briefing the president on all this. Here's Dr. Hill's testimony. Let's watch. So I was upset with him that he wasn't fully telling us about all of the meetings that he was having. And he said to me, but I'm briefing the president. I'm briefing Chief of Staff Mulvaney. I'm briefing Secretary Pompeo, and I've talked to Ambassador Bolton. Who else do I have to deal with? And the point is we have a robust interagency process uh, that deals with Ukraine. It includes Mr. Holmes. It includes Ambassador Taylor as the charge in Ukraine. It includes a whole load of other people. But it struck me when yesterday, when you put up on the screen Ambassador Sondland's emails, and who was on these emails, and he said, these are the people who need to know that he was absolutely right. Because he was being involved in a domestic political errand. And we were being involved in national security foreign policy. And those two things have just diverged. So the evidence is very clear. The White House meeting would only be scheduled if Ukraine announced the investigations that everyone, including the Ukrainians, understood to be purely political efforts to benefit the president. The only way to come to a different conclusion is to ignore the evidence. One additional way you can tell that this conduct is truly corrupt and not U.S. foreign policy, as usual, is that these officials, these lifetime career public servants, didn't just testify about this in impeachment proceedings. They contemporaneously reported this conduct in real time. Their reactions illustrate that this was not the kind of thing that both parties do when they have the White House. This was something different, something corrupt, something insidious to use Ambassador Sondland's characterization in later testimony. The officials who instinctively recoiled from the corrupt deal that Sondland blurted out were distinguished, patriotic public servants. Let's go through some specific examples of that evidence. After the July 10 meeting we just talked about where Ambassador Sondland made clear the agreement that the White House meetings were conditioned on the investigations, Dr. Hill consulted with Ambassador Bolton and told him what she had heard. Ambassador Bolton gave her, as she put it, very specific instruction to report this conduct in real time, and she did. Here is her testimony. Let's watch. A specific instruction was that I had to go to the lawyers 
to John Eisenberg, uh, our senior counsel for the National Security Council, uh, to basically say, you tell Eisenberg, Ambassador Bolton told me, that I am not part of uh, this whatever drug deal that Mulvaney and Sondland are cooking up. What did you understand it to mean by the drug deal that Mulvaney and Sondland were cooking up? I took it to mean investigations for a meeting. Did you go speak to the lawyers? I certainly did. Again, investigations for a meeting. The quid pro quo. Consistent with Dr. Hill's recounting, after both the July 10 meeting and the July 25 call, Lieutenant Vindman reported that he had learned, learned to the lawyers. Here he is discussing that later interaction. Let's see it. And you went immediately and you reported it, didn't you? I did. Why? Because that was my duty. Lyndon, when Lyndon said he reported this conduct again because that was his duty. He acted as he did out of a sense of duty. And as a Purple, purple Heart veteran with confidence in America, he would be protected for doing this right thing, even if it angered the President of the United States. His father, who fled the Soviet Union to come to this country, worried about his son fulfilling that duty. Here was Colonel Vindman's message to his father. Let's listen. Dad. My sitting here today in the U.S. Capitol talking to our elected officials is proof that you made the right decision 40 years ago to leave the Soviet Union and come here to the United States of America in search of a better life for our family. Do not worry, I'll be fine for telling the truth. You realize when you came forward out of sense of duty that you were putting yourself in direct opposition to the most powerful person in the world. Do you realize that, sir? I knew I was assuming a lot of risk. And I'm struck by that word, don't worry, that phrase, do not worry, you address to your dad. Was your dad a warrior? Uh, he did serve. It was a different military, though. And he would have worried if you were putting yourself up against the President of the United States, is that right? He deeply worried about it, because in his context, there was, there was the ultimate risk. And why do you have confidence that you can do that and tell your dad not to worry? Congressman, because this is America. This is the country I've served and defended, uh, that all my brothers have served, and here, right matters. Thank you, sir. Yield back. Imagine, he had to tell his father, do not worry, I'll be fine for telling the truth. It was his duty, because in America, right matters. President Trump has suggested that all of the witnesses are never Trumpers. That couldn't be further from the truth. As we just saw, this U.S. officials are brave public servants. It is wrong, just flat wrong. To suggest they were doing anything other than testifying out of a sense of duty, as Lieutenant Colonel Vin Vinman testified. But it wasn't just U.S. officials whose reactions show us that this was wrong. It is also clear. Okay, we're going to wrap up our special report right here on the Riley Network. I hope you all enjoyed watching. If you want to continue watching the ABC News Live special report of the impeachment trial, you can just head on over to the Riley King Network Facebook page and you will see a link of that live stream of the full coverage of the House impeachment trial of President Donald Trump if you want to continue watching the impeachment trial.
or you can go to the ABC News Live Facebook page to see it there as well. But we shared a link for you guys to make it easier for all of you. Have a wonderful night, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed watching this special report right here on the Riley King Network. I'll see you back here tomorrow with more coverage of the Donald Trump impeachment trial. Good night and goodbye, everyone.